The emperor, according to Colonel Gao Bois' report, was not insensible to the firmness displayed by the empress, but he did not share in her sanguine expectations. He wrote her word to proceed to Orléans, and it will hardly be believed that the officer who was the bearer of his dispatch was ordered to be accompanied by an aide-de-camp of the emperor of Russia, who, on the banks of the Loire, was to serve as a protection to her, who had formerly been the sovereign of half of Europe. It is true that some hordes of Cossacks were already marauding in the neighborhood of Beaugency. The chivalric mind of the Emperor of Russia suggested to him the more gallant course of sending one of his aides de camp to protect the journey of the Empress rather than order off to at least a respectful distance those bands of plunderers. This can only be accounted for by his feeling a secret pleasure in assuming the appearance of protecting the Empress. We shall soon see that he kept another species of insult in reserve for her. The arrival of that aide-de-camp at Blois on such a mission created an unfavorable impression. He issued passports to the suite of the Empress who could not accompany her on her journey except under the Muscovite's protection. The members of the government proceeded with the sovereign as far as Orléans. The passport given by the Russian aide-de-camp proved a service to them. For a party of Cossacks actually pushed on as far as Beaugency and plundered some of the equipages of the suite. The Empress arrived to Orléans, where she was received with all the honors due to a sovereign. The troops were under arms, and the public acclamations followed her to the very palace, notwithstanding that the people were acquainted with everything that had taken place in Paris. I felt a prey to the most gloomy reflections when I beheld the town of Orléans full of troops. We had left the still greater number at Bois, to which place were successfully removed the depots of Versailles and Chartres, as well as the column of troops of the guard which accompanied the Empress, all which movements had taken place in conformity with orders from the Minister of War. How happened it that all these troops were joined to the corps of Marshal Mortier and Marmont, which defended Paris? No other reason can be assigned than that the neglect was intentional, since they amounted to more than 20,000 men. If to those troops be added the resources of the arsenal of Paris, it must then be acknowledged that there was exhibited a want of judgment or a want of courage, and that the emperor's service on this occasion was very ill attended to. The empress had scarcely reached Orléans when an agent of the provisional government made his appearance. The object of his visit was not known, but he had just been released from the dungeon of Vincennes. His mission pretended nothing favorable. The conjectures to which it gave rise soon assumed the character of reality. Monsieur Dudon, who had been put into confinement for having quitted his post, deserted the army of Spain and instilled into the whole country through which he passed the feeling of terror to which he had given himself, himself given way, carried in his pocket a document calculated to gratify his revengeful spirit. It was a decree, such at least as made its appearance in the Moniteur, the reasoning of which too well expresses the system of deception resorted to at that period not to be again made public in this place. It was worded as follows. The provisional government being informed that in consequence of orders from the sovereign whose forfeiture has been solemnly pronounced on the 3rd of April, 1814, considerable funds have been carried away from Paris on the days immediately preceding the occupation of the city by the allied troops that those funds have been removed by various means of transport to several points of the kingdom that they have even been swelled by the plunder of many public chests in the departments that the municipal chests and even those of hospitals have not escaped that system of pillage and being desirous of bringing back to the treasury as speedily as possible the funds which have been withdrawn from it and which belong to the public service Decrees as follows. Article 1. Any person holding in deposit or retaining funds proceeding from the abstraction and plunder above described is required as soon as he shall be informed of the present decree to make a declaration of the said funds to the mayor of the district nearest to the place of his residence in order that the deposit of the said funds may accordingly be effected into the chest of the receiver general or the municipal chest of the said district. Article 2. Every person entrusted with the transport of the said funds 
whatever may be his capacity is required to instantly to stop the same to make his declaration to the mayor of the nearest district and to effect the deposit of those funds. In the manner stated in the preceding article, Article 3, every commandant of the military escorts is called upon to act in the manner prescribed in the above articles and to look to the immediate deposit of the funds. Article 4, every magistrate, civil, or military administrator, prefect, mayor, or commandant of a town is required as soon as he may have information of a transport of the nature described in the present decree to oppose by all of the means at his disposal the passage of the said transport and see that the deposit of the funds conveyed by it made in the manner pointed out in the foregoing articles. Signed, the Prince of Benefento, the Duke d'Alberg, François de Jaucourt, Bernonville, and Montesquieu, done at Paris, 9th of April, 1814. The decree was positive, and it's in its injunctions it dwelt upon the subject of plunder of public funds, nothing more just than to bring back to the Treasury what had been improperly withdrawn from it. Unfortunately, the facts did not justify the intentions expressed in the decree, or rather, the intentions are manifestly in contradiction to the facts. For Mr. Dudon was no novice in the business. He was not likely to commit a mistake. If he had, he did not do so in the present case, since his operations were approved of. Let us now consider the course which he adopted. He repaired from Paris to Orléans by the direct road, which could not have been that by which the government of the region had carried away any public chest, since it had not taken that road. Besides which... Previously to Mr. Dudon's being sent on his mission, it had been, or at least might have been, well ascertained by an inquiry into every branch of administration that no public funds would ever had been carried off. This object in view, however, was not the recovery of this description of funds, which is already readily affected. Who, in fact, did Mr. Dudon apply to on his arrival at Orléans? To Mr. de la Bouillerie, the treasurer of the civil list, and as such possessing no public funds, it was wished to lay hands upon the money which that functionary had in his chest, but it was well known that the decree could not reach it. Accordingly, no serious attempt was made upon him in order to obtain possession of his funds. Recourse was had to Monsieur Genin of Chambéry, an officer of the select corps of gendarmerie who had charge of escorting the money. The young man, finding this to be an opening for him on the road of fortune, consented to Monsieur Dudon's wishes. He assembled his attachment and ordered of his own authority the horses to be put to the transports containing the Emperor Napoleon's private treasure, for they had not been unloaded, and he commenced his march for Paris, where he arrived without meeting any obstruction on the way. In this manner was the private treasure carried off. No respect was even paid to the Emperor Napoleon's wardrobe. On the 12th of April, the cars were brought back to the courtyard of the Tuileries, which they had left on the 30th of March proceeding. In a short space, three days therefore, Monsieur Dudon had repaired Orléans and brought away from it a heavy transport, which ought to have taken four days at least to travel over the ground between that town and the capital. How was the journey performed with such extraordinary rapidity? How is it possible to reconcile the date of the decree which that of the return of the funds? I cannot account for it unless... I admit a rather plausible version circulated at the time. This was that the decree was not so much intended to authorize a plunder, which had not been reckoned upon as to sanction what had actually been done. Be this as it may, the spoils had well nigh been the occasion of discord amongst the soldiers who carried off the booty. Each would claim the honor of having originated the idea and urged his right to a larger share. The intervention of France was resorted to and the prize was deemed sufficiently valuable to reconcile the difference of all parties. It has since been asserted that the occurrence above related only took place after the dissolution of the provisional government. This is incorrect, as is sufficiently attested by consideration of the date of the decree. The money, moreover, arrived in Paris on the very day of the entrance of the Comte d'Artois to that capital. The prince could not order that to be done, which was already effected. I now return to the conduct of the agent of the provisional government. His mission appeared of so pressing a nature that hardly sufficient time was left for carrying into effect various arrangements which the emperor had prescribed when Monsieur Dudon unfolded the object of his journey. 
He was desirous of annulling the orders given in consequence of the Emperor Napoleon's instructions, but it was pointed out to him that those of which he was the bearer could not have a retrospective effect, and he was compelled to take matters as he found them. It is proper to observe that the money which the provisional government had sent directions to seize upon was the Emperor's property. It did not proceed from the public revenue. It had not been drawn out of the public coffers. There could be no justice, therefore, in requiring it being returned, if any indeed ever found its way back into the treasury. If it was lodged into the public chest, it could only be entered as proceeding from an act of plunder, for it never can have been found that any money had been withdrawn for those chests of the Emperor's service. The agent of the provisional government claimed the crown jewels, which were returned upon a regular schedule and with the most scrupulous exactness. None were wanting except the diamond called the Regent, which is generally kept separate in consequence of its high value and of the facility there existed for carrying it off. No one was aware that the Empress kept in a work bag the mounting of one of the Empress swords in which it was set. An account was brought to her of what was going forward. She immediately took out the mounting and gave it up. The jewels, which were her own property, were in the same place with the rest. She did not ask a single question with the view of ascertaining if they had not been carried off. Mr. Dudon was not yet satisfied. He took possession of the scanty supply of plate which had been removed for the use of the Empress and of her son. He did not leave her a single cover and went to such lengths that it was found necessary to bar the plate and china belonging to the bishop at whose house she resided for the two days during which she remained at Orléans. Such was conduct held towards daughter of the Emperor of Russia, Austria, the ally of the Emperor of Russia, and within view of the latter who had one of his aides to camp at Orléans. It cannot be denied that the Emperor Napoleon acted in a very different manner when in the days of his prosperity he was arbiter of the destinies of many princes and kings and especially of the relatives of the Emperor Alexander. The period of the residence of the Empress at Orléans was one of uniform suffering for that unhappy princess each moment brought fresh causes of alarm along with it. The emperor had written to her to dismiss the ministers, the members of the government who had accompanied her, as well as the great officers of the crown. She gave publicity to this order, and each one testified his eagerness and his desire to repair to her presence and to lay at her feet the last mark of their respect by assuring her of their deep regret at her misfortunes. She received in succession all those who presented themselves. She begged of each to retain some recollection of her and expressed a wish for their happiness. Her face was bathed in tears, which would have melted a heart of stone. She held out her hand for them to kiss, and afterwards dismissed them. Chapter 11. On the day following this mournful ceremony, the Empress found herself almost deserted and alone in the town of Orléans. Everyone had taken the road back to Paris. I had also taken my departure when an accident, which I shall presently relate, compelled me to return to Orléans, where I stayed two days longer. The Episcopal Palace at which the Empress was residing had assumed an altered aspect. Hardly any other persons were to be seen except the two or three ladies who had remained in attendance upon her and the King of Rome. The moments which the Empress passed in this manner must have been bitter beyond description. Her situation was such that she could no longer enjoy any repose. The Duchess of Montebello, her lady of honor, was the only person living with her on terms of close intimacy. The other ladies who accompanied her were not admitted to the same degree of confidence. Madame de Montesquieu enjoyed no greater share of it then was necessarily bestowed upon the individual who had wholly devoted herself to the care of watching over the tender years of the King of Rome. The Arch-Chancellor had not come so far as Orléans. On leaving Blois, he had taken the road back to Paris. His advanced age, added to his infirmities, rendered any change of place extremely painful to him, so that in these trying moments the Empress had no other person than her lady of honor to advise with, having been presented to the confidence of Maria Luisa by the emperor himself, that lady had justified the choice of the sovereign by the most unremitting attentions. Maria Luisa entertained for her friendship as sincere as if she had been one of her sisters and to great delight in conversing with her respecting that sister. The lady of honor was, as well as the sovereign, wholly devoted to the emperor. Like her, however, she was also greatly affected at the storm that had burst over their heads. They collected every report, communicated to each other their feelings of alarm, and thus increased the state of anxiety to which they were both a prey. 
though under circumstances of a very different nature. The general topic of conversation for some days past had been a pretended design formed by the emperor of making an attempt upon his life. I do not believe that anyone ever took upon himself to advise his terminating his career in such a manner. Those alone who were longing to be released from all ties of gratitude towards him have expressed any surprise at his having had the courage to outlive such accumulated misfortunes. For my part, I am of opinion that he, that had he put an end to his life, such an act would have been censured and ridiculed. This course is only befitting a man who cannot escape the infamy that attaches to him, but a great mind should always be proof against the shafts of misfortune. The report of the emperor's death had at first been circulated at Blois, and afterwards, in a more circumstantial manner, at Orléans, it was even asserted that letters had been received from Fontainebleau announcing that all would be over the next day. These reports had certainly reached the ears of the Empress, for she fell into a state of nervous affection, which deprived her of sleep. Madame de Montebello was equally restless. The various reports in circulation had produced such an effect upon her that she fancied everyone to be a messenger of death. The emperor wrote almost every day to the empress, who was quite alone at Orléans. He did not urge her to join him at Fontainebleau. He did not even ask her to do so, presuming, no doubt, that she would better consult her personal advantage by remaining at a distance from him than by coming this year in his misfortunes, a step which might possibly have been displeasing to her father, to whom the emperor recommended she should write, since he had no means at his command of affording her protection. The tender attachment he felt for her imposed upon him the painful sacrifice of dissuading her from joining him, however much he would have derived consolation from her presence. I have beheld this princess inwardly struggling between two contending sentiments. What? her attachment for the emperor suggested to her heart and what her deference for the least intimidation intimation on his part had made it a law for her to comply with she did me the honor to address to me at orly on the following words i am indeed much to be pitied some advise me to proceed others to remain I write to the emperor, and he does not reply to my request. He tells me to write to my father. Alas, what can my father tell me after the inquiries which he allows to be inflicted upon me? I am deserted and must now trust entirely to divine providence. It had once suggested to me the wisest course when it inspired me with the idea of becoming a canoness. I should have done much better in yielding to that inspiration than in coming to this country to repair to the emperor possible that my son who looks up to me as his natural protector on the other hand the emperor is apprehensive of an attempt being made upon his life a very improbable circumstance and is compelled to fly the embarrassment i should be to him might occasion his falling into the hands of his enemies who there is no doubt have sworn his ruin i know not what to decide upon i only live to shed tears in fact they were running in abundance down her face while she concluded these words Whenever an officer from the emperor made his appearance, he was announced to Madame de Montebello, who rose to receive him. If he arrived during the night, she then entered the apartment of the empress to hand in the letters directed to her. Monsieur Anatole de Montesquieu presented himself at this time coming direct from Fontainebleau. He first went to his mother in the King of Rome's apartments from whence he had himself announced to the Duchess. He was introduced into a room where she had passed the night, wrapped up in a shawl and stretched upon her bed without undressing. She received Monsieur Anatole de Montesquieu in this manner and without giving him time to open his lips. Well, she said, is it all over? Is he dead? Anatole, who was not aware of her previous state of alarm, fell to add a less lost to understand the question what do you mean madame he replied to whose death do you allude why rejoined the lady of honor the emperor's death we've been told here that he has destroyed himself no madame said monsieur de montesquieu he's not dead he's in good health how can you believe the reports circulated by his enemies here is even a letter which he has entrusted to me for the empress madame de montesquieu the mother of this officer who was extremely strict in the practice of every virtue and of every duty was not so easily alarmed, but she only saw the empress when the king of Rome was taken to her. If she had possessed any influence over her majesty, she would no doubt have given her some useful advice. This, however, could not have been productive of much good. 
for during the four years that the Empress had resided with us. She must have often heard that the Austrian alliance has always proved fatal to France, and ever since that power had declared against us, the Emperor of Austria's conduct had been so unceremoniously censured. And some of the observations applied to it must have reached the ears of the Empress. It must, however, be acknowledged that they were but too well warranted by the events. She was fully sensible of it and had sufficient penetration to distinguish the truth. Whatever disguise it might assume, she could not conceal from herself the effect which her father's conduct was calculated to produce upon the minds of the whole nation. I can understand, she was sometimes heard to say, that the people should feel an aversion for me, and yet there is no fault of mine. But why did my father promote my marriage? If he meditated the projects which he is now carrying into effect, her imagination was exaggerating the fact for, at all times, the utmost respect was felt towards her. Her mind was a prey to a crowd of conflicting ideas with regard to events beyond the reach of her inexperience, but... Whatever might be said to induce her to come to a determination, she had lost all confidence in the future and was prepared for whatever might occur. It has been made a matter of reproach to her that she did not go to the island of Elba. This was unjust. Her conduct, however, has only been disapproved of by those who were ignorant of her position and of that of the emperor, by our very enemies, who, being fully sensible of the power of opinion, which that princess and her son exercised over France sought every means of rendering her unpopular. It was only pain, a merited compliment to the sound sense of the nation, to suppose it would look with a feeling of aversion upon any error emanating from a vicious heart. This feeling, however, could not apply to the empress, who was too sincere to be the object of suspicion. I have stated all the motives which form the basis of her determination. I will now add to them a few reflections, which may serve to explain how far that determination may have been influenced by the advice of her immediate attendants. Madame de Montebello, who was possessed of a very large fortune, was not at all disposed to bury herself alive in the island of Elba. Her inclinations led her back to Paris, where she could live in a state of independence. She was sufficiently acquainted with the feelings of the empress to be well satisfied that if she again met the emperor, no power would ever prevent her from sharing his fate, in which case the duchess would be under the necessity of accompanying her Accordingly, she urged with great warmth the propriety of adopting the course recommended by the emperor out of addressing herself to the emperor of Austria. As no sooner should that princess be restored to her family than her attendant would be relieved from all further obligations. The entreaties of the lady of honor were backed by some treacherous hints. The empress was told that the emperor had never loved her, that he had enjoyed the favors of several mis mistresses during his marriage and had only wedded her through modus of policy but that after the turn which matters had taken she would be exposed to unceasing reproaches the empress gave way to these representations she wrote to her father and it was no doubt owing to his invitation that she repaired from orleans to rambouillet we shall soon see what occurred at their meeting let us now return to certain allegations still put in circulation by the allies for the purpose of misleading public opinion chapter 12 we have seen that Prince Schwarzenberg had replied to the overtures of the Duke of Treviso by transmitting to them a document insulting to the Emperor's character. It was a fresh manifesto in which, following up the system of deception put in practice at Frankfurt, the Allies opposed to pretended moderation to the ambitious views of the sovereign who was fighting in defense of his territory, ever ready to lay hold of any circumstance calculated to alienate us. From the public opinion, they took advantage of the errors committed by the diplomatic branch of his service to arraign the intentions of the chief of the state. Let us reassign to every one the share that belongs to each in this series of unfortunate or cowardly acts ending in the destruction of that splendid edifice of glory, which it had taken 20 years to erect. Did the emperor obstinately persist in continuing the war regardless of the calamities which oppressed his subjects? Did he, as the allies accused him of having done, reject any project of reconciliation tender with the view of procuring an armistice on those conditions upon which he might have obtained a peace? Let us inquire into the facts, trusting to the declaration of Frankfurt, the Duke of Vicenza, in the powers which he had drawn up for his own guidance, imposed upon himself the obligation of no longer treating upon any other basis than those which the sovereigns themselves had promulgated. 
Having been detained, however, at the advanced post of the enemy, he soon acquired the conviction that nothing farther from the intention of the Allies than to grant to France those limits of which they had held out the promise. He solicited fresh powers in which no mention should be made of frontiers no longer likely to be obtained. These powers were expedited on the 4th of March in such terms as the negotiator had looked for. Napoleon had hesitated to invest them with a signature, either from deeming it an error in principle to begin in a work of negotiations not yet entered upon by a concession, the consequences of which might be the most serious nature, or from considering the basis laid down at Frankfurt as the only plank of safety he could lay hold of in the wreck of his fortunes. The idea of submitting to any other conditions was an impressive weight upon his mind. In the meanwhile, a letter was brought from Chatillon, addressed to the Duke of Bassano. The Duke of Vicenza expressed himself as follows. We must not give way to feelings of illusion. The power and resources wielded by the enemy are immense. If the emperor possesses armies sufficiently numerous with the aid of his genius to ensure victory, nothing in that case should induce us to give up an inch of ground within our natural limits. But if we have been so far betrayed by fortune as to possess the resources we stand in need of, let us yield to necessity what we can no longer defend, what our courage can no longer reconquer. Obtain, therefore, from his majesty a positive determination in a question of so much importance. A decisive course must be adopted. I must not be bound down by any restrictions. Does the safety of France depend upon a peace or an armistice to be concluded within the space of four days? If so, I solicit precise orders which may leave me at liberty to act. The Duke of Bassano handed the dispatch to the emperor and urged him to yield to necessity. Napoleon reluctantly listened to him. He pointed out to his minister a passage in Montesquieu's works, which he appeared to be running over in an absent manner. Read this aloud to the emperor. The minister read as follows. Nothing, in my opinion, exceeds the magnanimous resolution taken by a monarch who swayed a scepter in our days rather to bury himself under the ruins of a throne than to accept a proposal which no king ought to listen to. His mind was too elevated to suffer him to descend to lower than his misfortunes had already brought him, and he was well aware that a crown may be restored to its splendor by a display of courage, but never by an act of infamy. Twelve years before this time, Napoleon has said to his minister, who is beginning to obtain a great share of his confidence, I am acquainted with a man who will listen to anything. The Duke of Bassano recollected the expression. I know of a still more magnanimous act, he replied to Napoleon, that of sacrificing your glory in order to close the precipice into which France would be plunged along with you. Well then, be it so, rejoined the emperor, conclude peace. Let this be Calicourt's work. Let him sign what he pleases in order to obtain it. I may have the strength to bear the shame of such a peace, but never expect that I shall dictate the terms of my own degradation. The recent example of the Congress at Prague had already been a lesson to the Duke of Bassano and ought to have taught the Duke of Vincenza how possible it would be to obtain that Napoleon himself should propose one by one the conditions he would have to submit to. The prince relied altogether upon his plenipotentiary, whose opinions expressed in energetic language had just been submitted for his perusal. He ordered the following answer to be written to him. It appears that the conditions have been already agreed upon beforehand between the allies. As soon as they shall have communicated to them, you are at liberty to accept them or to refer the question to me within a delay of 24 hours. The alternative in this case might have embarrassed the proceedings of the plenipotentiary. The Duke of Bassano earnestly insisted that a fresh order should be issued for the purpose of removing the conditional nature of the former one. This gave rise to a long conversation which continued until a late hour of the night. He was at last authorized to write on the 5th, and he accordingly dispatched in all haste the following letter. I yesterday sent you a courier with a letter from His Majesty and full of the powers you had again asked for. His Majesty being on the eve of his departure from Troy as he directs me to send you a second courier and inform you in explicit terms that his majesty grants you a carte blanche to bring the negotiations to a favorable issue to save the capital and to avoid a battle upon which depend the last hopes of the nation these expressions which were unreservedly approved of 
by Napoleon, were energetic and precise. Nevertheless, the Duke of Bassano did not deem them strong enough. He felt it necessary to procure for the authority which they conveyed a character of greater strength and solemnity in order to serve as an ample guarantee to the plenipotentiary, whatever use he might make of it, and to protect him in case of need from the consequences of his own responsibility. With a view to this object, he added the following words. The conferences must have commenced yesterday. The fourth, his majesty, has deemed it advisable not to wait until you should have brought the first overtures to his knowledge in order to avoid the smallest delay. I am therefore instructed by Monsieur Le Duc to intimate to you that it is the Emperor's intention you should consider yourself invested with all the powers and all the authority necessary in these important circumstances so as to enable you to adopt the course which may appear to you most suitable to the object of arresting the progress of the enemy and of saving the capital. These were the powers given by the sovereign. We have now to see the use to which the negotiator applied them. The Congress had opened on the 5th of February. The sitting, which was adjourned to the following day, did not take place. The circumstances affording time for the French plenipotentiary to receive his carte blanche. This document came into his hands in the course of that day. The enemy's ministers again met on the seventh and announced the conditions upon which they were willing to make peace they were nearly similar to those which the emperor was on the point of assenting to when he was informed of Blucher's imprudent march. Nevertheless, so far was Monsieur de Calancourt from accepting them that he threw every difficulty in the way. He claimed the basis laid down at Frankfurt, wished to know which of the powers was to derive the benefit of the sacrifice imposed on France, to what purpose they were to be applied, and even insisted upon being furnished with a statement developing the views of the Allies in their combined form. These pretensions were altogether incompatible with existing circumstances and only calculated to raise a doubt of the intentions of the sovereign in whose name they were presented. This inconsistency was pointed out to the duke. He perseveringly insisted in claiming those very limits which he himself had urged the propriety of giving up, and after the lapse of two days consumed in an obstinacy which could be attended with no good effect, he yielded assent to what was required of him. But instead of concluding... The proffered peace he solicited an armistice, which his instructions did not authorize him to apply for. He went farther at this painful crisis, in which the smallest delay might prove fatal. He did not even suggest the adoption of the extraordinary course which had originated with himself. He consulted M. de Metternich, who was at the distance of 20 leagues from the spot, and laid his intentions before him. Nothing could be better calculated to meet the views of the Allies. They had all witnessed the invasion of their respective capitals. Our eagles had been planted in Vienna, Berlin, and Moscow. Their pride was wounded at the recollection of those achievements, and they thirsted with the desire of visiting upon us the degradation which we had inflicted upon them. The triumph obtained at Brienne appeared to hold out a pledge of their succeeding in the object of their ambition. They wanted nothing more than to delay the delay requisite for reaching Paris. A peace on those terms upon which it was pretended to force the emperor's acceptance of it offered the ready means of their succeeding in the views they meditated. The conditions tendered were of the most painful nature. It was expected that he would hesitate in giving way, and his hesitation would enable the allies to accomplish his downfall. Their appalling calculations were justified by the unaccountable pretensions set forth by the Duke of Vincenza. The foreign diplomatists were in a state of undisturbed security when Concord suddenly recalled the step he had taken and consented immediately to relinquish for the sake of an armistice every point which had been the subject of discussion in anticipation of a peace. The Chevalier Fleuret to whom this confidential communication was made, instantly imparted it to Monsieur de Stadion by whom it was transmitted to Count Razumovsky. The latter did not delay a moment in making up his mind on the subject. The English plenipotentiaries had no personal injury to avenge. The Count was aware that peace would be instantly concluded as soon as they should learn that France relinquished Antwerp and Belgium. There existed but one means of averting such an event. He laid hold of it and demanded in the name of his sovereign that the conferences should be suspended. He was no doubt fully sensible of his being indebted to the twofold heir of Monsieur de Vincenza for the advantages he had acquired. The latter diplomatist, however, was not a man 
possessed of any personal importance. The only object was to effect the emperor's ruin, and care was accordingly taken to impute to him the blunders of his negotiation. The allies were not satisfied with fixing this false imputation upon the emperor. They farther accused him of having long delayed in furnishing his counterproject of a piece, of having, in short, again brought forward pretentious, wholly incompatible with the ex existing state of affairs. Let us now consider whether those ill-timed pretensions are to be ascribed to him or to his plenipotentiary. Napoleon had caused the following observations to be addressed to his plenipotentiary on the 25th of February. Prudence, no doubt, requires that every means should be resorted to for coming to an arrangement, but his majesty is of opinion and he desires. I will again write to you on the subject that these means, or at least the data by which you may acquire knowledge of them, should be found out by yourself and that any information concerning them cannot be furnished by him to you, but must necessarily be supplied by you to him. The emperor agrees with you in opinion that this is the favorable moment for treating if there be a possibility of concluding a peace. But in order to judge of the existence of such possibility, he must be made acquainted with those lights which the negotiations or your intercourse with the negotiators shall afford him instead of those data, that information, those lights adverted to by Napoleon, he merely received representations void of any useful hints respecting the general posture of his affairs and dispatches of his plenipotentiary contain commonplace observations on war recommendations and demands in which the rules of propriety were occasionally transgressed the grand equerry proved himself as ill calculated to treat with his sovereign as with the allies he did not enlighten his judgment he only inflicted wounds the emperor always felt less disposed than ever to give way after the receipt of any of his letters on the 2nd of march the emperor had sent from la ferte sujuar the elements of a counter project on the 8th he addressed to the duke of vicenza a long letter of which we republished the following extract monsieur de rumigny has just arrived dot, 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 the draft which his majesty has sent to you with his letter of the second contains the material of the counter project which your excellency is empowered to present his majesty has left you every latitude in the revision of it it is necessary to make sacrifices for the attainment of peace those sacrifices bear upon certain portions of territory belgium and on the left bank of the rhine the annexation of which affected as it was in a constitutional manner has been acknowledged by numerous treaties the emperor cannot under those these circumstances propose the abandonment of any part of the territory he may consent to certain concessions and peace cannot be obtained by any other means but this he can do only when such concessions shall be demanded of him in bulk according to the project which the allies have handed into you that project however is the first demand and the first demand cannot well be their ultimatum you will reply to them by accepting the proposal made by them at frankfurt and such reply being also the first on your part cannot be considered as your ultimatum his majesty is better acquainted than anyone else with the state of his affairs he is therefore more sensible than anyone else of the necessity of obtaining peace he is however unwilling to secure it upon conditions more severe than those which the allies might actually be disposed to admit the emperor therefore would have consented to those conditions if his plenipotentiary who had been carrying on negotiations for upwards of a month had been capable of understanding them of appreciating their value being fully impressed with their importance and had demonstrated to his sovereign that the allies would never depart from them a man of determined character would have been discovered in that letter abundant grounds to warrant his coming to a conclusion the dispatches in question contain this farther passage you are in possession of his majesty's sentiments respecting the proposals which they might consent to accede to those proposals are detailed at full length in that letter which distinctly names dutch burbau vesel castle kale and mems if necessary if the allies are satisfied with these nothing stands in the way of our concluding a peace if they require more you will have to discuss each case in order to 
secure a modification of them. You will proceed orally to any lengths you think proper. And when you shall have succeeded in obtaining a positive ultimatum, you will then have it in your power to refer the question to your government for its final instructions. Yet this letter exhibits a state of embarrassment and hesitation on the part of Napoleon, and a certain degree of displeasure at a plenipotentiary who gave him advice without affording him any effectual assistance. It also indicates that he desires to have peace, acknowledges its necessity, and his being only withheld through in apprehension of yielding to conditions which the enemies might otherwise abstain from assisting upon. You will proceed orally to any lengths you think proper. This was another carte blanche subject to a subsequent sanction of the proceedings. But if the plenipotentiary, after having availed himself of it and succeeded in obtaining a positive ultimatum, should not have it in his power to refer the question in consequence of the formal declaration that if he does not accept the conditions within 24 hours, the negotiation would be immediately broken off. He is then to give way and to subscribe to the conditions unless the phantom of his personal responsibility should arrest him. The emperor's intentions were not better fulfilled on this occasion than they had been on the former one. The two declarations which the Duke of Vicenza caused to be inserted in the protocol of the Conference of the Tenth were not as required by the Allies. A counter-project framed on the draft sent to him by the emperor on the second, but mere observations which rather magnified than softened down the pretensions he was urging. This was not overlooked by the emperor, who instantly sought to apply a remedy. He wrote from Rams, where the Duke of Vicenza's dispatches had overtaken him, a letter containing important concessions complicated by certain conditional expressions, which would have had the effect of replunging his point of attention into those perplexing predicaments which had grown habitual to him. It was difficult to manage that minister. He felt an unwillingness to penetrate the meaning of any observation, would take nothing upon himself, and required the most precise orders, but when those orders enjoined him to make peace on any terms, he took alarm at their very precision. This is what occurred at the beginning of February, but after six weeks of protracted negotiations, he should have seen his way clearer than before him and might have been expected to lay aside some of his timidity. He should have been sensible that a long polemical discussion was no longer seasonable when events were progressing with rapid strides and when his couriers took four days to reach the Imperial headquarters. At this critical juncture... The transmission of unlimited powers was the only means of attaining the object in view, if still within reach. The Duke of Bassano was authorized to issue them, but in order to produce a more striking impression on the plenipotentiary's mind, he persuaded Napoleon to address him direct. Those letters dated from Rams from 17th of March contain the following passages. His Majesty, having taken into consideration the content of two letters dated the 13th, the duplicates of which reached him last night, and the originals this morning allows you all necessary latitude, not only as the mode of proceeding you may deem it proper to adopt, but also for the purpose of making in a counter project such concessions as you may conceive to be indispensable towards preventing a rupture of the negotiations. Monsieur the Duke de Vicence. I give you full authority to make all the concessions that are indispensable for the purpose of keeping up the negotiations and of eventually obtaining a knowledge of the ultimatum of the Allies. It being understood that the concessions to be made by the treaty shall have the effect of procuring the evacuation of our territory and the mutual restoration of all prisoners of war, ETC. Napoleon. Another letter from the Duke of Bassano, dated the 19th, contained a renewal of this authority with an explanation that Napoleon placed no limits to its exercise. It is high time, the letter went on to say, that we should at last acquire knowledge of the specific sacrifices which France is required to make as the price of obtaining peace. At the very moment when Napoleon was dictating these words and still pressing for information on a point which his negotiator uh, long ago to have cleared up to him the allied plenipotentiaries declared at Chatillon that the negotiations were at an end. Let us again turn to their proceedings. They had replied on the 13th to the verbal declarations made by the Duke of Vicenza on the 11th by circumscribing the duration of the proceedings to a term of 24 hours. Thus, plenipotentiary therefore could no longer entertain a doubt that the plan of the treaty which they handed in must have been their ultimatum, barring a few modifications. 
He demanded a fresh delay. It was granted, and he presented at last a counterproject on the 15th. He therein made no allusion to the Dutch Brabant, to Vesel, Castle, Mentz, or Kale, all which he was authorized to relinquish. His declarations of the 10th neither modified nor softened down any point. No interest was overlooked in them. Neither the Princess Eliza, the Grand Duke of Berg, the Prince of Neuchatel, nor the Principality Benevento, the most petty German princes, was taken under the protection of the French plenipotentiary, who demanded by the 16th article that the arrangements to be made respecting ceded territories and the indemnities to be granted to dispossessed princes should be regulated in a special congress in which France was to take part. Uh, protection, the more praiseworthy on his part, as he acted in direct opposition to the intentions of Napoleon, unequivocally expressed in the letter of the 8th in which Monsieur de Rumigny was the bearer. The emperor will throw no difficulty in the way in regard to the state of possession in Germany. He attaches no importance to interfering in it and will allow the Allies full liberty to act on that subject in any manner they think proper. Astonished at this circumstance, the Allies sarcastically reminded the French plenipotentiary that he had offered six weeks before the terms of an armistice, what he now refused as a condition of peace. The negotiations were accordingly broken off. How are we to blame in this case? Who is answerable for the consequences of the ru rupture? Certainly not the Emperor. Chapter 8. The Comte d'Artois, who, it will be recollected, was still at Vesoul, left that town as soon as he received the courier who brought him intelligence of the events which had taken place. He reached Paris on the 12th of April. A crowd, impelled by motives of curiosity, had collected on his way. He made his entry to Paris with a kind of triumphal pomp and was harangued by Monsieur de Talleyrand, who was in attendance at the Gate of Ponty. With the members of the provisional government, he answered this address and uttered the word so often repeated since, Nothing will be altered. There is only one more Frenchman amongst you. Great publicity was given to this reply, as it is customary to do with respect to every word issuing from a prince. In this case, a particular object was aimed at, that of calming the fears of those who dreaded a return to the sway of the emigrants. The Comte d'Artois mounted a horse at the gate of Saint Martin, proceeded along the suburbs, down the boulevards, the Rue Napoleon, the Rue the Rivoli and alighted at the Tuileries in Paris. The sight of occurrence attracts a crowd of spectators. And one of this description was so little expected a month before that the feeling curiosity was in proportion to the surprise generally felt. The entry of the Emperor of Austria took place a few days after the arrival of the Comte d'Artois. That prince came by the road leading from Burgundy. All the Allied troops were placed under arms and proceeded to meet him as far as the gate of Saint Antoine with the Emperor of Russia and the King of Prussia at their head. The three sovereigns returned together on horseback, followed by the same troops which proceeded along the boulevards from the Bastille to the Place de la Revolution where they filed off. It is very difficult to credit the assertion that the Emperor of Austria should have consented to the project of dethroning his daughter, and yet no reasonable motive can be discovered for his absence from the Allied army. The least unfavorable opinion that can be formed of his conduct is that in order not to appear to participate in the act or from an apprehension of being involved in scenes of parental tenderness, he had prolonged his absence and left to his allies the care of sacrificing his daughter. It must be acknowledged that they have amply performed the task allotted to them, and that the Empress was justified in complaining that she was deserted and could place no reliance on a father who tolerated the insults to which she was subjected. Every species of degradation was heaped upon us. It was a struggle who should most debase himself, and our posterity will refuse to credit what I am about to relate. A few days after the entrance of the Allied army into Paris, the Emperor of Russia ordered divine service to be celebrated according to the Greek rite, and a Te Deum was to be sung in thanksgiving for the capture of Paris. With a view to increase the pomp of this ceremony, he directed that an extensive scaffolding should be raised on the Place de la Revolution, upon which an altar was erected. Ugh. At this altar happened to be the place over the very spot where Louis XVI had been sacrificed and nothing had been published on the subject of the religious ceremony of the Russians. It was generally believed that all these preparations were intended for the purpose of celebrating some expiatory service, 
But the truth soon became known. The whole allied army was ranged around the altar, near which were placed the Greek clergy, who were in attendance at the Emperor Alexander's headquarters. This prince soon made his appearance, accompanied by the King of Prussia, and all the princes and generals belonging to the allied army. It will scarcely be believed, however, that in the midst of this assemblage, who came forward to thank the Almighty for our destruction and to raise their voices in chorus over the lifeless remains of our unfortunate soldiers. Some marshals of France were to be seen in full uniform. It was a contest between them and the Cossacks who surrounded the Emperor Alexander, who should be nearest to the autocrat. Bereft of all further authority, these men had quitted their troops for the purpose of assisting at a ceremony which covered them with shame. And they did so in the very heart of a capital, already indignant at the de degradation it was compelled to submit to. It was reserved for unhappy France, whose glory had been raised to so high a pitch to fall on a sudden to the most abject condition and to be compelled to record by the side of the grandest achievements those disgraceful and unbecoming acts which tarnished their brilliancy. From the time of the Battle of Fleurur in 1794 to the Battle of Wagram, the Austrian armies had constantly waged against us an unsuccessful war. We twice obtained possession of their capital, and yet, though deserted by fortune, not one of their officers was ever false to his standard. Not one of their generals ever disgraced the national uniform. The emperor was still at Fontainebleau, where he was making preparations for his departure for the island of Elba. He first set in motion the 1,200 men of his bodyguard who had determined to share his fate together with 100 Polish soldiers, who preferred to follow him rather than place themselves under the standards they had so long opposed. For the emperor Alexander had already united in Paris those troops to his own army. The emperor was urged to quit Fontainebleau. It was represented to him that the king was to reach Paris on the 21st of April, and that he ought not to be within so short a distance as to hear the firing of the cannon, which would be the signal of his public entry. The emperor readily penetrated the motives which influenced those who urged him to depart, but he paid no attention to them. He was aware that his life was aimed at, and he deemed it more prudent not to commence his march until the handful of men who were to watch over his safety should have it in her in their power to protect him from the snare which might be thrown in his way. He wished to have it in his power in case he need to throw himself in the midst of those gallant men and travel in their company to the seaside. If that precaution were found to be necessary, he was therefore indifferent to whatever was said to him with the view of accelerating his departure. He was still beset by importunities. He took leave of everyone and thereby restored freedom of action. To those men who anxiously looked forward to the moment when they might quit him with that dishonor, he was... In fact, almost wholly isolated on the last days of his residing at Fontainebleau, he owed it to the Prince of Neuchâtel to express the wish of retaining him in his company. He had sufficiently loaded him with favors and wealth to justify his supposing that Bertier would not desert him in his adversity. He accordingly proposed that he should accompany him and be felt the more confident in doing so as he was ignorant of the meeting that had taken place at the prince's residence where the resolution was adopted and proceeding to the most painful extremes unless he abdicated the throne being obliged to reply to the emperor's overture Bertier protested his fidelity and promised not to desert him but he asked leave to repair to Paris for a few days in order to settle his affairs and destroy a few papers which had been left in his closet. The pretext was sufficiently plausible not to give rise to any suspicion. The emperor, however, who was gifted with great penetration, was not at a loss to guess his real meaning. Bertier, he said to them, you do not speak your mind. This is quite wrong on your part. If you desire to quit me, why not candidly say so?